Hi everybody, Professor Wills here. Welcome back to one of our uh, mini lectures about uh, the art history of the ancient world. Well, we are in the 12th century here in France looking at medieval art, specifically Romanesque art. Um, this is the era, as I've talked before um, in our um, lessons, that uh, there was real angst um, about uh, the fate of one's soul in this era where Christianity has, has uh, basically spread everywhere and uh, a, a concerned about what would happen if sin uh, reigned supreme, what kind of horrible monsters and devils would take over the world, um, or for that matter, what would happen on Judgment Day um, in the second coming of Christ when Christ resurrected, you know, comes back and judges everyone, whether they're, you know, going to get into heaven or condemned down to, as my kids say, H-E double toothpicks or hell um, in some kind of eternal purgatory. So this is sort of the mindset. And let's take a look at um, examples of Roman-esque um, sculpture and sculptural relief that really underscores this uh, messaging. All right, let me move on to our um, PowerPoints here so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Okay, let's travel to France now, to Moisac, and we're looking at circa 1100 to 1115 at a cloister, um, or a better known as a monastery courtyard, found at a, um, um, a church complex called uh, Saint Pierre, Saint Pierre, actually. Um, so, um, you have to imagine, you know, this is a very religious time. Religion was taken very seriously. And if you are a monk or a nun, uh, for that matter, you've likely given up all of your worldly possessions and practice a very um, restrictive, disciplined um, devotion to God filled with daily prayer. And of course, you need kind of a quiet retreat to do that in. So a, clo a cloister in many ways is a um, kind of a uh, like a garden-like courtyard area where you could uh, walk the corridors and pray, contemplate, meditate, um, that kind of thing, often surrounding some kind of fountain or garden, that kind of thing. Many of the California missions here in California have that as well. So what's remarkable about this particular cloister that makes it such a typical Romanesque example of art are the column capitals. As you can see, some of these are singular columns. Some of these are uh, pairs of columns or colonnettes, but they all share the similar um, a size capital, but it's not any of the capitals we're familiar with, you know, whether Greco-Roman. We're looking at more individualized and unique, um, I guess, limestone uh, reliefs um, of some of the things that we, uh, that are of top of mind in the Romanesque world. So let me give you a little bit of a close-up of that. Here's another vantage point of that same courtyard at the cloister of Saint-Pierre. Getting closer here, I'm gonna take myself away for a few minutes here because it's here with this great high focus photo that you can see some of the images that would be typical on these column capitals. Now they might be biblical scenes or the lives of saints. Sometimes they are abstract patterns, but what's most intriguing and probably entertaining for the modern viewer is the subject derived from these books called bestiaries. Um, some people say bestiaries, um, but these were books that were all the rage in this point in time in history because they were collections of illustrations of real or imagined animals and monsters. So um, for those of you who are Harry Potter fans, you probably uh, know about this um, fictionalized textbook from Hogwarts called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And of course, it's a whole new um, cinematic movie uh, um, division of the Harry Potter world. Um, but um, the monsters that the kids had to study at Hogwarts, you can see how J.K. Rowling 
um, was inspired by these real books, these bestiaries, these books of beasts and monsters that were that were very popular because it wasn't to entertain as we are entertained by monster stories nowadays. It was more to literally horrify people to make them believe that if the world didn't toe the line um, and please God and um, live a sinless life and not, you know, if people weren't good Christians, that really the devil would rise up and all of these monsters and demons and beasts would take over the world. So this cloister illustrates that kind of apocalyptic takeover of monsters. So for instance, here you can see a winged um, griffin-like bird, um, um, you know, in kind of mirror image. Um, so what you find is a aesthetic that is translated or almost lifted from our unit on Hiberno-Saxon um, and Anglo-Saxon arts um, from the early medieval period. You remember all of those um, warrior lord types, whether Saxons or Vikings, uh, traveling um, from their, um, you know, hubs in Europe or Scandinavia, bringing that more abstract aesthetic. Sometimes it's just through the dominance of pattern that you see at the cap, the tops of these um, column capitals, but sometimes you see it in the sculptural reliefs as well. So um, an example here that you we talked about, of course, is this purse cover that was part of a uh, ship burial found in southern England um, that was an Anglo-Saxon, probably king or some high-level uh, person who had these kinds of luxury objects. So though the purse has now rotted away, you can see this kind of leaning towards abstract design. We talked about the animal interlace style where you get this kind of vine-like tendrils and animals woven into that aesthetics, but often in mere image, or arranged in symmetrical pairings. You can see, of course, monsters down here, you know, um, capturing a man. Look right here, something very similar. Now, I'm not saying these sculptors studied this Hiberno Saxon uh, purse cover. I'm saying that the legacy of these ancient warrior groups who migrated and kind of took over. Uh, much of Europe and the British Isles brought with them an aesthetic that be married with Christian arts. And we saw that in the wonderful gospel books of the illuminated manuscript tradition. And now we're starting to see that translated into this era of the Romanesque period, this era of the revival of sculpture, of stone carving, whether to build churches or to create elements like elaborate column capitals. So again, uh, griffin-like beasts, half lion, half bird, tearing into the head of this poor um, human, but look at the symmetry, the near imageness, uh, the pattern. It is very reminiscent of what we studied earlier. Here's another example here. Um, this is almost looks a little bit with this kind of tendril-like botanical motifs, very reminiscent of illuminated manuscripts in the animal interlace design. We have three bat heads um, here, and then up above here, we have additional griffins biting the hindquarters of these lions. But again, you know, what you see on the left, you see on the right. So that balance and symmetry, that's such a warrior lord aesthetic, now a part of the Romanesque aesthetic as well. All right, very good. One more thing I wanna take you now to um, a view of the, the Church of Saint-Pierre. Um, so we're looking at the same time period, the same years, 1115 to 1135. This is the south portal or door into the, this church. And you have to keep in mind that in the 12th century, um, it was very common to find people illiterate. You know, not a lot of people knew how to read. So art was an important way to visually connect with 
um, the people on the streets, so to speak. And of course, we've talked about the Romanesque period being this great era of um, embarking on a pilgrimage, um, traveling from one pilgrimage church in one town to another, making great arduous journeys to earn points essentially to get into heaven as you visit the important relics and treasures associated with saints inside these churches. So one way to get attention, and this is a shift that we're going to see that we did not see in the medieval world or earlier medieval world or in the Byzantine era, is um, a shift back to not only decorating the inside of these churches, but to decorating the outside. This is something we're going to see in both the Romanesque and medieval world. So let's take a look at this element right above the doors here. So in many ways, it's like a billboard. It's meant to catch the eye, send a message to the viewer, and motivate a certain set of actions, which is basically Christ is the door to your salvation. So what you find here is a sculptural relief in a half moon shape or lunette shape called a tippinum. So a tippinum is something that first appears in the Romanesque world. They'll be common in the next era, the Gothic world as well, but it is the semicircular lunette above the doorway and it's very comparable if we can flash back to the Greco-Roman world and the temples dedicated to you know an array of different gods and goddesses it's very sim similar in concept to a pediment meaning it's meant to catch the eye and have a connection to whatever religion is practiced there so let's get a close-up look at that sculptural relief so what you find here is a theme of the second coming of Christ. And this is the belief that Christ resurrected will come back and judge those on judgment day of who's worthy of getting into heaven and who's, you know, unfortunately condemned or damned to hell. So um, not surprising, we've seen in the medieval period and we continue to see this in the Romanesque period, a return to disproportionality and hierarchy of scale with Christ presented in the center of the composition. He's flanked by four symbols, and it was a little hard to see in this image because of pollution and, and uh, you know exposure to the elements, but four symbols of the of four evangelists surround him, as well as rows of kings from kind of biblical history who have supported Christ. Uh, they are associated with being like the 24 elders, um, kings at, you know, of, of, you know, of history who have supported him and followed him um, on this Christian path. Moving forward here, it's very reminiscent um, in many ways to what we saw in the um, late um, antiquity, late empire of the Roman era, with Constantine, the famous first Christian Roman emperor, surrounded by his followers, flanking him in this scene from the Arch of Constantine, the distribution of the largesse. Here's a little close-up of Christ once again, surrounded by uh, the four symbols of um, the evangelists, um, again, the authors of the New Testament, and of course, Christ being a New Testament figure himself. So, um, you know, the whole message, Judgment Day, is pretty heavy stuff. It's, it's basically a bit of a browbeating for um, the medieval uh, Romanesque, you know, a viewer of this uh, tippinum outside the doors of Saint-Pierre. It's meant to remind you that you know, you can still be saved even if you're a sinner to get yourself in through those doors and to see your connection to Christ and Christianity as your salvation for your immortal soul. So that does it for today. Um, next time we'll get into more uh, Tippinim sculpture, so close up of some of those kings craning their necks up um as well as um oh one more got a glance at a sculptural post that supports that tippinum to the doorway um and 
this is a great example of um, sculpture that I want to share with you. I think I'll save that for another video because it's very interesting um, depiction um, on um, 